such a pleasure to get to talk to the Michigan Quality Improvement Network. Um, just a little bit of context, uh, Strata South, we are a nonprofit organization based in Minnesota. We lead collaboration and innovation in healthcare quality and safety. We do a lot of work. We say we work at the intersection of research, policy, and practice. So we aren't researchers, we aren't policymakers, and we do not deliver direct care, but we sit at that intersection and help interpret research and policy into practice, help find findings from practice, get into research and policy, and really provide a lot of work and context around um, supporting rural providers, critical access hospitals, and folks with the FLEX program trying to be right kind of on the cusp of all three of those areas. So our really our overall focus is to make lives better. Today, I have a ton of information to share with you. There is a lot of inf things happening in the CMS quality measurement space. And I know that um, some of you are newer to this. So the um, MICA leadership also asked me to talk about some things that aren't new, but also kind of just a refresher. For example, we're gonna talk about the overall hospital star rating, um, how and why those get calculated for your hospital or why they might not be getting calculated for your hospital. We're gonna talk a bit about electronic clinical quality measures because there's some pretty big shifts underfoot in that space in terms of increasing reporting requirements. And then also just kind of give you some context for some of the other changes and anticipated changes in, in quality measures from CMS that are relevant for critical access hospitals. So it will be a lot of information. I have links and Details sprinkled all the way through these slides, so I hope that they will serve as a reference for you. Please feel free to actually just chat in questions as we go. I think that might be easier than trying to circle back at the end. So please go ahead and ask questions as you have them. Just a reminder about the Medicare Beneficiary Quality Improvement Program, or MBQIP. It is the primary quality improvement activity under the Medicare Rural Hospital Flexibility Grant Program, or the FLEX Program, under which I know your Quality Improvement Network has been organized. Really focuses on improving quality of care in critical access hospitals by using a common set of rural relevant hospital measures. And there have been updates recently made to the MBQIP core measure set that reflects some of the newly available measures from CMS. So CMS has a whole bunch of measures. A subset of those measures have been highlighted and are used as part of the MBQIP program. So just a little bit of a reminder about what's in the MBQIP measure set and how that fits together with some of the federal reporting channels. I always have to apologize when I show people this slide because it is complicated. There are multiple reporting channels because there's multiple ways that the measures are gathered and captured. The primary uh, portal for most of the CMS measures is the Hospital Quality Reporting Program or, the, or portal, the HQR. And that is where your eCQM and hybrid measures would get uploaded in there. The format is a quality reporting data architecture file. Your CMS outpatient measures that get submitted via cart or a vendor tool for MBQIP, that's the OPT18 measure, also get submitted into HQR. The web-based measures where you go in and enter the data into a portal also go into HQR. And then the HCAP survey, although your vendor is likely the one interacting with that system, also go into that HQR portal. There's also the NHSN, uh, the National Healthcare Safety Network portal that's managed through CDC. And that's where the uh, healthcare worker immunization measure and the antibiotic stewardship measure get reported. The antibiotic stewardship is captured through that annual facility survey. There are also two sets two measures that are not CMS measures. We're not really gonna talk about these two today, but just wanted to highlight that they're another piece of the MBQIP program. There is the CAW Quality Infrastructure Survey that is in the field right now. So I know Amanda would love it if you all fill that out. <laughs> she will probably be sending a link if she, um, again soon if she hasn't already. And then there's also the Emergency Department Transfer Communication Measure that gets submitted directly to the state flex, pro flex programs as well. So that's sort of the summary of the MBQIP measures. And we're, the rest of the session, I'm really going to talk about what's happening at CMS, but we'll connect back to how that fits with MBQIP. So a poll question for you all, it just gives me some context of who's on the 
phone. I'm curious about how long you've been involved in quality improvement or quality reporting. So less than one year, one to three years, five to nine years, or more than 10 years. So we'll give folks a few seconds to fill that out. And then Amanda, let me know when we have, when it looks like most folks have been able to answer that. Yeah, about 18 of the 22 participants. All right, so let's see our results. Oh, can I, I don't, can I? I think you can share them. There we go. So we have a good proportion of you have been here greater than 10 years. Okay. But a handful also less than a year or less than three years. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Yeah. So for those of you that have been around for a while, this is probably isn't going to be surprising. For those of you that are new, you may not be aware of this. So <laughs> there is actually a lot of changes that happen over time with the CMS quality measures. They change regularly. They are identified and updated for the CMS programs through an annual rulemaking process, which is actually even longer than a year, but there's a kind of an annual cycle to it. So the inpatient measures are defined and um, come out through the inpatient perspective payment system rule process. And that lists all the inpatient quality reporting measures and the Medicare promoting interoperability program measures. So those get tucked into that inpatient perspective payment system rule. The outpatient side, actually the outpatient quality reporting measures are in a different rulemaking process under the outpatient or the OPPS program rule. And they are not on the same timeline and they are not managed by the same groups at CMS. So if you're ever feeling like there's some disconnects between what's happening with the inpatient measures and what's happening with the outpatient measures, I would say that it's actually gotten better over time, but they're actually run by different parts of CMS on different timelines. So that can be sort of confusing when we try to think about how it fits together, because clearly your outpatient, your emergency department and outpatient departments are attached to your hospital, but the processes for how those rules and the measures come through those that system are separate. Before they, any measures end up in a CMS program, there's actually what they call a public pre-rulemaking process. And they have a pref CMS has a preference for measures that have been through an endorsement process. So for years, that endorsement process was uh, managed by the National Quality Forum or NQF. So you oftentimes might have heard about NQF quality measures or NQF endorsed measures. That uh, contract to manage that process turned over two years ago now in 2023, or about a year, a little over a year now. And that process is now managed by the Partnership for Quality Measurement from Battelle. So we've got a whole new kind of slew of acronyms. So there is still a pre-process where they CMS puts out a list of measures that get reviewed by a consensus-based group. They provide feedback, CMS takes that feedback and does whatever they want with it, and then comes out with a pre a proposed rule where they'd say, this is what we're proposing. There's a feedback opportunity. And then there's a final rule that says, this is what we're going to implement. And that happens every year. And for a while, CMS seemed to be largely removing measures. Um, particularly some of the measures that were relevant for rural hospitals. But in recent years, we've actually seen them adding quite a few measures. So I have joked that this presentation used to be shorter. It's gotten longer in recent years. So that's a little bit of context about how that process happens. I also just want to give you a little bit of context about sort of what how, how I interpret or how I kind of think about try to figure out where CMS is going. So they have programs. This is essentially their CMS strategic plan. You could think of it that way in terms of how they're going to do measurement. So they're calling it C CMS Meaningful Measures 2.0. There was a 1.0. So this is sort of an ongoing every few years, particularly oftentimes with an administration team, there's sort of um, administration change. There's a pause and CMS says, okay, let's relook at what our priorities are over the coming months or coming years. So this is where they've decided to focus right now um, is the Meaningful Measures 2.0. They've said that they wanna focus on quality measures of the highest value and particularly prioritizing outcome and patient reported measures. So those two pieces are important. The patient reported measures are, we're seeing much more movement on that. I will give you some examples shortly. They've said they also wanna prioritize outcomes. So those are things like morbidity and mortality, 
but they've also recognized that those things are actually pretty hard to measure. So we're seeing a little bit of a shift in terms of CMS being more willing to do what we're calling structure, they call structural measures, which talk about what types of things your programs have in place. So that's been a little bit of a pendulum. CMS removed almost all the structural measures. Now they're adding in a bunch of new structural measures. So we'll talk about some of those as well. They've also been doing some efforts to align measures across programs. There is a wide variety of quality measures, some of them very similar across multiple programs. So we some, see some efforts there. I think this um, bullet around fully digital is one of the more important ones. Um, they That used to say 2025, they have updated it to say 2030, but CMS is, is on a very intentional path towards making the quality data collection and process more digital or electronic. And they're looking to incorporate all payer data. Also important as we've been seeing more and more Medicare Advantage. Um, a lot of the measures that get calculated with claims right now are only on traditional fee-for-service Medicare, which is in a lot of places only about half of the population. The other priority we're seeing, and we're seeing that definitely come through in some of the more recent measures, is trying to focus on reflecting social and economic determinants of health. So this is CMS's house. These are the areas that they've said they want to focus on. And then underlying all of that, they've identified that they really want to focus on that individual and caregiver voice. So they have come out um, about a year ago now, a little over a year. They came out with something that they're calling the Universal Foundation. Um, this aligns with this kind of CMS um, Meaningful Measures 2.0 piece. I've been doing this work for a really long time. So I have to admit, I'm a little jaded. And CMS has been talking for at least a dozen years about alignment of quality measures, streamlining of quality measures, harmonizing quality measures, identifying a parsimonious set of quality measures, all terminology that has been used over the past decade or so. This is the more recent piece about this. And they've, they came out with a New England Journal of Medicine article that announced this back in March, 2023. It said, here's the measures. So here's 10 measures that we are going to align all of the CMS programs around. So there, and that's fairly significant when we think about CMS also being the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. So that would be the Medicaid programs, the CHIP programs, Medicare Advantage. It's got sort of a broader reach than just the straight up CMS. And so most of the measures are not particularly hospital measures. So there is... Um, all cause readmissions included. There is social drivers of health included, but a lot of them are much more population. Like, are we getting people getting immunizations? Are they getting breast cancer? So the thing that I'm optimistic about this most recent kind of move towards trying to align quality measures is they actually drew a line in the sand and said, here's the measures. We haven't seen that before, but they've also recognized that we also need measures that are kind of more specific to that. So there, this is their language, not mine, <laughs> that they're calling add-ons for sp specific populations and settings. So an attempt to kind of move towards alignment towards this one set of measures, but recognizing that, for example, in the hospital, there's other things that we need to be measuring as well. So I've highlighted in here the ones that are where I bolded the ones that are also MB quit measures, but this is looking at, they wanna look at mortality, screening for social drivers, H caps and or outpatient caps, safety measures. We're seeing actually a fairly significant push towards CM, from CMS around safety measures. So we'll talk more about that later. And then also care coordination. So looking at the all cause readmissions and the median time from ED arrival to ED departure. So unlikely that any of these measures will actually go away in the near future from CMS because they are prioritizing them on the list. Phew, okay. That is the big picture about where we think CMS is going. So we are gonna shift gears now and talk about star ratings. So I have another poll for you guys. Curious about how often, whether or not your hospital typically meets the threshold to have an overall hospital quality star rating calculated. And if you don't know, that is perfectly fine. So while you guys are answering that, um, a little bit about star ratings. They 
There's two different ratings that get published by CMS if you go out to Care Compare. So there is an HCAPS or a patient experience star rating that gets calculated if you have at least 100 return surveys in the most recent period. So there's out that patient experience star rating is separate. But then there's also this overall hospital quality star rating, and that incorporates HCAPS, but it also incorporates all of the other measures on Care Compare. So what's our poll results? Okay. So a mix, almost evenly split. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to talk a little bit about how this gets calculated because it's one of the things that um, we actually get a lot of questions about because it is a little bit confusing. And honestly, it doesn't work particularly well for rural hospitals. So the, star, the overall star rating, CMS has indicated that the intent is to summarize the current care compare measures into a single rating that's uh, easy for patients and consumers to interpret whether or not it actually gets used by patients and consumers is a different question, but that's their intent for it. But it is complicated. And the way that they have the thresholds set up and the calculation set up is that a lot of the small rural hospitals actually consistently don't meet the threshold to have a rating calculated. And that's been even lower in the recent years. So as many as 80% of critical access hospitals or small rural hospitals don't meet the threshold to have one calculated. That used to be closer to 50 or 60%. So a little bit about how it's calculated. Um, I'm going to walk through some of these. I won't go into deep detail, but I want to give you the, sort of the big picture. So every time they calculate it, it gets refreshed about once a year. They take all of the current hospital care compare measures. And remember my comment, the care compare measures, what's out there for measures is always changing. So every time that this gets pulled, they're pulling the current measures. So what as the measures change, the what, what is in incorporated into this methodology as the measures also changes. They group the measures into different categories and then they calculate group scores based on those. We'll talk about those categories more. They come up with a summary score. They apply a threshold. This is where most of the rural hospitals fall out. We'll talk about that as well. And then they do some peer grouping. The peer grouping is new. Um, they just updated the methodology a couple years ago, and that was a new step. And then they calculate the star rating off of this. So this is the big picture of what we're going to walk through. So what measures are included? Um, there is a spreadsheet or a, a, it looks like, an, I think it's a PDF, but it looks like an Excel file that I asked Amanda to share with you guys that has the list of measures, including the time frame and the data source that was used in the most recent refresh, which was July, 2024. So they have the measures in five different groups. There's mortality measures, which are essentially death rates for a variety of different patient groups. Safety of care measures, which are your hospital acquired conditions or infections and complication measures. Readmissions, which include the straight up readmission rates and your hospital return days or your excess days in acute care, the EDAC measures. Patient experience, it's based off of HCAPs, only incorporated if you have at least 100 return surveys. And then they have what they call the timely and effective care group, which consolidates what used to be in a couple of different groups, but it's essentially all of your process measures. So if efficient use of um, medical imaging, timeliness of care, those types of measures. So the reason that I have the mortality and the safety of care in bold and red is because they are important for the threshold for calculation. So to have an overall hospital quality star rating calculated, you have to have at least three measures in at least three groups, but one of those groups has to be safety or mortality. So if you don't have at least three measures in safety or mortality, you don't get a star rating calculated. And that's where we see most of the rural hospitals fall out. So in the previous methodology, readmissions was included. So that's what we oftentimes saw more hospitals um, meet those thresholds for readmissions. Important to note that critical access hospitals almost never meet the threshold to have the safety care measures reported on Care Compare. Maybe if you do, it'll be one or two measures. Um, very, very rarely do critical access hospitals have three safety of care measures. So essentially, to get a star rating calculated, you have to have hit the, that mortality category. And the data is old, and it's currently truncated due to the PHE, COVID PHE period. So 
that mortality measures are typically calculated with a three-year period. The data that was used in the July 2024 release is from 2019 through 2022. And because CMS didn't use any of the data from the first two quarters of 2020, it's only looking at 30 months of data instead of 36 months of data. And it's only traditional fee-for-service Medicare. So I oftentimes, the question I will get is usually framed something like this. My CEO wants to know what I did wrong and why we don't have a, calc a, a star rating calculated. <laughs> you did not do anything wrong. It's all about how many patients you had that were traditional Medicare three years ago, essentially, is what gets you a star rating calculated. So <laughs> that's probably the biggest question I, I get about um, star ratings. Happy to answer questions on that. If you haven't, please put them in the chat. Couple things, more things on how this is calculated. So you have those different groups. There's wanted to highlight for you that the timely and effective care group or those process measures are actually weighted a little bit lower. So they will come up with an average of the measure scores in each of those measure groups and then calculate them together. But the timely and effective care or the process measures are weighted lower. If you don't have measures in all the groups, they will reproportion the weight. So pretty common for critical access hospitals is that you'll have mortality, readmissions, and timely and effective care, but no measures in the patient experience or, or um, safety. So in that situation, then the mortality would be almost 40, readmissions would be almost 40, and the timely and effective care group would be the rest of that score. So for those of you that maybe hit one safety of care measure, oftentimes that safety of care measure ends up being kind of an outsized proportion of your score. Because if you meet that overall threshold to be have a rating calculated, all of the measures that are available are included. So that's another question I end up getting quite a bit. We had one comment that says, yeah. can Carla present this to our CEO, CFO <laughs> in November? <laughs> a great question. Uh, um, a little bit about peer groupings um, because they are kind of a newer piece to the pie. Um, the intent of peer groupings is to address concerns about the comparability of hospitals because there are fundamental differences, size, volume, patient care. I like to pick on Johns Hopkins. There's no reason that a small rural hospital in Michigan should be compared to John Hopkins. I don't know why they're the ones I pick on, but really if you think about the services that are offered, that they're, they're different. So rather than actually just peer grouping folks Using those characteristics, CMS is using the number of measures and measure groups available as a proxy for that. So if you have at least three measures in five measure groups, you're in one bucket, four measure groups, you're in another, three measures, you're in another. So you end up with most of your our small rural hospitals in that four measure group and three measure group. But I highlight the percentage here because what has happened is then 80% of the hospitals are compared over here. And then we have these different smaller comparisons for what's largely our smaller rural hospitals. And what happens with the methodology is they do some statistics. So they pull this all together and they basically put it into a bell-shaped curve. And so you have, um, and then they do something called K clustering and they do the cut points. So you end up, your bell-shaped curve is quite a bit smaller in those four measure and three measure groups than if everybody was compared against each other. And so what happened with this methodology change is that we used to see critical access hospitals almost never had a, almost never had a one star and less rarely had a five star. You were kind of more in the middle of the group. But now we have this smaller comparison group and you're still doing cut points. So we've actually seen with this methodology change, we've seen more critical access hospitals falling out in that one or two star group, part, part, in part just because of the way that it has gotten calculated. Carla, we have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of them is what efforts have been taken to advocate at the federal level for <laughs> rural equity with this measure? Yeah, and I will I will talk about that. Okay. And mortality has to have... Uh, the mortality does have to have at least three. So if you look at the spreadsheet type resource that I came, there's pneumonia, heart failure, COPD, AMI, stroke, overall mortality. I think I think overall is in there. There's a, different conditions that count. And the min minimum denominator is typically 25 for most of these measures.
Okay. Okay, a little bit more on star ratings, and we're going to move on. Um, timing is not consistent. The CMS has not been willing to say this is when we're going to release star ratings, but they have fallen into a pattern. So the pattern has been typically the last few years, they release the updated ratings in July, and they use the data that's um, published in January. So the January 2024 care compare results that were published are what were used to calculate the star ratings that were published in July 2024. Only 12% of critical access hospitals met the threshold to have a star rating calculated this last time around. Um, there is a 30-day preview period in advance of publication, and they do have hospital-specific reports that are pretty useful. So if you miss that preview report, you can go into QualityNet and request your hospital-specific report. I would encourage you to take a look. Um, because critical access hospitals aren't required, they don't um, require to report through the inpatient quality reporting program or the outpatient quality reporting program, that's optional for you. You could request that your star rating be suppressed from Care Compare, but you would have to do so in that preview period. And then I think this is what the other question was asking about is, it is it's really challenging to have a rating system based on a bunch of measures that don't work very well in rural hospitals. So I usually like to try to explain that the methodology is essentially the recipe. So I like to bake, I bake chocolate chip cookies pretty regularly. And if you think about making chocolate chip cookies, there is a whole bunch of kind of standard ingredients, right? It's butter, chocolate chips, flour, eggs, but they come together in different proportions and maybe with some different instructions. And the methodology, that's all that is. It's your recipe. It's how you're pulling it together and putting it together and packaging it. So if you think about the methodology as a chocolate chip cookie recipe, it really doesn't work very well if you're missing half the ingredients. And that's really the challenge that we're faced in terms of the rural relevancy a lot with a lot of these measures is that they're pulling together a rating system where a bunch of the hospitals don't meet the thresholds to have the measures calculated. So we are seeing some changes and we're, what we're seeing in terms of measure changes on care compare that have, are going to have an impact as part of what we're going to talk about next. Okay. Now we're going to jump to eCQMs, you guys. Uh, electronic clinical quality measures. I anticipate in the next two years, maybe less, I won't have to like define what an eCQM is anymore. I like to do so just to make sure we're all on the same page. It is essentially just a cl clinical quality measure that's electronically extract extracted from electronic health records. So again, I've been doing this for a long time. Several of you have been as well. And Quality measures used to almost all be chart abstracted, and that is largely going away, um, really kind of shifting largely to or directly pulling the quality measures out of electronic health records. And that's essentially, that's all the definition of an eCQM is. So I want to highlight for you, this is a vision from CMS around eCQMs, um, and it says that hospitals will primarily be able to switch to EHR-based reporting for many of the measures that are currently manually chart abstracted. And the reason that I continue to keep this quote is that I wanna highlight for you when they said it. CMS said this back in 2016. So at that point, it was the first time that they were incorporating electronic clinic quality measures into the inpatient quality reporting program. They said, we're gonna have you collect four measures. We're gonna, you can pick from a list, you can submit one quarter, and then next year, basically, you're going to submit all your measures this way. <laughs> um, I laugh because we're still not there. It's been eight years, but we are definitely now moving that direction and pretty quickly. So there was several years in there where it was really, you could do four measures, you got to pick from a list, but now CMS is really kind of moving forward on this quickly. So I think, and I'm not going to get who got said the quote right, but it's something along the lines of we overestimate the amount of change that's going to happen in two years and underestimate the amount that's going to happen in 10. So I think we're getting closer to the 10 year point here and we are definitely seeing this, this strong movement from CMS. So I do have to call out for you that um, although critical access hospitals are not held to, by CMS to the um, payment penalties, if you don't report to the inpatient quality reporting program or the outpatient quality reporting program, so OQR or IQR, those programs are optional. Critical access hospitals can report the measures, but there's no payment penalty for you. 
Promoting interoperability is required, and it is required for critical access hospitals to report the eCQMs as part of that. So promoting interoperability was formerly known as the EHR incentive program, and oftentimes is still colloquially called meaningful use. So when you hear those EHR incentives, meaningful use, promoting interoperability, those are all, those are all the same thing. So this is based on a calendar year deadline. The next submission will be for in February for the calendar year 2024. And that is new that they're starting to increase the number of measures that are required. So 2023 reporting is long past, but I wanted you to, to see the difference. So um, most recently, CMS had this three self-selected plus the safe use of opioids measure, which is an MBQIP core measure. 2024, you need to do those three self-selected measures plus safe use of opioids plus two pregnancy-related measures if you um, do OB delivery services. So here is the measures that are available currently to select from. And you see that we've, they're adding a handful of measures here. The cesarean birth and the severe OB complications are required. If you don't provide those services, you are required to do a zero denominator declaration. And then they are also proposing, um, they're gonna expand the population for this global malnutrition composite score to 18 and older. It was current, it was originally specified for 65 and plus. So for the next two years, you can pick three of these measures plus you're required to do these other measures. We still have some rural relevancy challenges. Um, most critical access hospitals don't keep stroke patients. Um, and some of the other, I think the hospital harm ones, a lot of folks are looking at the hypo and hyperglycemia one. The opioid related adverse events is another one that where they're looking at um, whether or not folks had to do like rescue naloxone while they're in the inpatient. Um, pressure injury is certainly relevant. And then acute kidney injuries, I don't know if we'll see quite as much um, of that as relevant as well. But this is sort of the over the next two years. So later on, I will share you there's some big changes coming in this ECQM space in terms of where CMS is prioritizing patient safety going forward. So we'll get to that in a few minutes. Uh, reporting is just, um, you either submit a flat file, it's in a QRDA, it's called the quality data reporting architecture file with all of your patients, or you do a zero denominator declaration, or you do a case threshold exemption, which is that you have less than five cases in a reporting quarter. So even though you report all four quarters, you report a year's worth of data, it actually is by quarter. To be honest, I'm not sure that I know the CMS logic behind having either a case hold threshold or a zero, why it couldn't just be one, <laughs> one or the other. But there's two options. If you don't have any cases, you do zero denominator. If you have less than five, you do case threshold. Um, if you're going to do those, all of this goes into that uh, HQR portal. Hardship exceptions, they are case by case. So there is an option for hardship but it's not a standard set of, if you check these boxes, we're gonna give you a hardship exemption. So there is more information here. Typically the hardship um, is due. So like the 2023 reporting hardship exemption is typically due in November. So um, if you're in that situation, there's more links and information here. Outpatient CQ ECQMs are very new. So the inpatient ECQMs, they started back in 2016, 2017. The first outpatient eCQM was available starting in calendar year 2023. And these are attached to the outpatient quality reporting program. The first one that they had available was this OP40. It's a STEMI measure. So those of you that have been around for a couple of years probably remember the chart abstracted OP2 and OP3, which were around early AMI care in the um, emergency department. So essentially that OP40 is clinically similar to those two measures. So it's whether or not you got fibrinolytic therapy within 30 minutes or PCI within 90 minutes or um, transfer within 45 minutes. So what happened to kind of for that early emergency department care? So the option to submit for this was 2024 for if you were a PPS facility, you were required to submit one quarter for OQR. 2025, you were required to submit two quarters. They've kind of had this building block piece um, for that going forward. This is optional for critical access hospitals to report. 
There's also a newer measure that's excessive radiation dose related to um, your CT. There's a parallel measure on the inpatient side that is also optional for critical access hospitals. It's one of the ones that you can select. I do have to highlight for you that because again, inpatient and outpatient are run separately in terms of reporting programs, reporting the outpatient measures does not meet the requirements for promoting interoperability. You have to report the inpatient measures for the promoting interoperability. If we have zero denominator, So if you have a zero denominator, so the guidance from CMS hasn't been particularly clear. I think what you're asking is, can we just submit three zeros? <laughs> um, so you are, there are other requirements in promoting operability. Your re medical record does have to be certified and specified to be able to report them. You could pick three measures that you have a zero and submit them. I think the intent is obviously that you would pick measures that you have denominators for to submit, but I think that's really a call that your facility has to make. So I hope I answered that question. And some of you, if particularly if you're part of your, a system, your system is picking which measures you're submitting, right? It's not really up to you. So that's really your, your call in terms of which measures get reported. Okay, I see you, thank you, good. <laughs> okay, um, public reporting. So this is how we tie back to the star, star rating. ECQM data is not currently reported on Care Compare. CMS has said that they are going to start reporting it. It's been a little confusing because they have been including it on your preview reports. If you're looking at your preview reports, they have had it on your preview reports for the last couple of rounds. So it looks like it's going to be on Care Compare, but they're not actually publishing it on Care Compare. So they have indicated with the October, so we should see a refresh on Care Compare here in the next, well, we got about a week left of October, right? Um, they have said that they are going to publish safe use of opioids on Care Compare this time around, which means that that measure would get incorporated into your STAR rating as a timely and effective care measure. But all of the other eCQMs at this point, they only release that data on um, what's called the provider data catalog. It's essentially public use files that is probably mostly people like me that go in and look at it. So it's like all these big Excel files that are, is the data that populates Care Compare. So the eCQM data is released in the public use files. But if I go up and I look on Care Compare for your hospital, the eCQM data is not included on Care Compare. So it's not incorporated at this point into your hospital star rating. So as we see them start to include more eCQMs on Care Compare, how that gets incorporated is a little bit unclear because a lot of the eCQMs are safety measures. And one of the reasons that hospitals don't meet the threshold is that you don't have a lot of safety measures where you meet the threshold. So I think that's going to be interesting to watch here as that starts to shift as, C as they start to publish the eCQMs. Okay, a little bit more on digital related measures. These aren't eCQMs, but they're connected. Um, hybrid measures is essentially taking a submission of clinical variables that gets you submit and they link them with um, data elements to combine them with claims. So there's two areas that CMS is trying to use hybrid measures for. One is around readmissions. The other is around mortality. So they're still using claims data as the base of the measure, but they're using the clinical data that gets submitted by hospitals to do better risk standardization of that. So the hybrid readmissions measure is one of the ambiquip measures. And on this, I think one of the things that's most interesting going forward is that starting with next year's submission, they are expanding the population to include Medicare Advantage. So depending on what you see in your um, community, I'm in Minnesota, even in our rural communities, is sometimes it's as much as 50% of our Medicare population is on Medicare Advantage. So that's a big gap. So we're starting to see sort of this little crack in the door in terms of just using traditional fee-for-service Medicare claims for some of these measures. The all-cause readmissions, um, the deadline was in September. Um, it is re encouraged for critical access hospitals. Again, it'll be part of the MBQIP measure set next year. 
I think it didn't go quite as well as CMS wanted it to this year. So it was, this was the first year of required submission for the inpatient quality reporting program was the data that was due September 30th. They have indicated through the outpatient rulemaking process, it's kind of a wonky process, but essentially kind of saying, we still really want you to submit it, but we're not going to hold anybody to the payment penalty for it this year. So, which in my mind says, Oop, maybe this didn't go quite as well as we wanted. So there is, they will still be moving forward with this, but I think it might be go a little bit slower, but we do encourage you guys to be reporting that as soon as you are able. And again, next year it will have the Medicare Advantage. And the other piece that ties back to the star rating is that as they move to this hybrid measure, that's what's going to be posted on Care Compare. That's what would be incorporated into your star rating. So one of the reasons to make sure you're kind of following along and reporting that is to kind of help ensure that that data is available. It's also readmissions is a pretty commonly used measure for the um, value-based care programs. So wanting to make sure that critical access hospitals don't kind of get left behind if they're not look, thinking about or looking at that hybrid data submission. And just for context, this is the type of data that gets submitted with that for the clinical variables and the linking data elements. So you would pull out first captured. It's in that same QRDA format that your eCQMs get submitted as well. Okay, more you guys, there's more. Okay, we have another poll real quick. Curious about what types of services that you guys are providing, um, labor and delivery. Oh, we forgot about, I had a poll question on eCQMs and I missed it. It blew right through it. Do you want me to do that one? No, let's go, let's move on. Okay. Thank you. So, I want to share with you some measures that are coming from CMS that are may or may not relate to services that you guys are providing, but I think are important to kind of highlight the direction of where CMS is going. So this next set of measures that I'm going to share with you are all things that CMS has passed. They're in process, but maybe they're kind of either newly reported or just getting going. So if you want to let me know if you do labor and delivery, total hip and total knee, cataracts or none of the above. So where are we at on that, Amanda? We are at about 16 out of 25, about 68%. Okay. I'll go, I'll go ahead and end it. There you go, and I'll share the results. <clears throat> okay. Oh, so a lot of you do hips and knees and cataracts. A handful of you do labor and delivery, and some of you don't do any of the above. Okay. Okay, that's helpful. Um, the maternal morbidity uh, structural measure in the birthing friendly, I highlight this for you because it's um, gotten a lot of attention, and I want to make sure that for those of you that are doing labor and delivery, you're avail aware of the connection. So this is one of those places where CMS has said, we really want outcomes, but they're kind of hard to get at. So we're going to do something structural. And what they're asking, what the reporting for this measure is essentially that you just go in and you attest. It's a yes or no. Did you participate in a perinatal quality improvement program? And are you implementing um, patient safety bundles related to inpatient labor and delivery? So if you can say yes to those, please, please, please do be sure you report. It's submitted annually, so the next reporting will be due May 15th, and it would reflect activities for 2024. Again, if you don't do labor and delivery, you can select, there's a not applicable, so you could do that as well. But part of the reason I wanna make sure that you folks are aware of this is because that CMS has also started doing what they're calling a birthing friendly hospital designation. So if I look at Care Compare, there's this like pink little mom and baby looking symbol that if you say yes to that attestation question and you do labor and delivery services, you are designated as a birthing friendly hospital. And there are, I think, other implications to that birthing friendly designation. So example, some of the large insurance um, companies are using that designation in their provider guides, those types of things. So I just don't want any critical access hospitals if you're doing labor and delivery and you're doing all the work to make sure that you're not missing the opportunity to have that designation. They have in, indicated um, 
that likely in the future there will be a more robust set of metrics required to have that designation. But really right now, it is just whether or not you say yes to that attestation question. So anticipate in the future that some of those ECQMs will report it in, but to make sure that folks um, are aware of that designation and that reported measure. This is a way I talked early on, I mentioned that there's some real, real interest from CMS in really focusing on a better understanding what the patients, uh, what the patient thinks about care. So certainly patient experience is one of these things, but they're moving more and more to what they call patient reported outcome measures or PROs, PROMs, sometimes we see them called. And so there is a new, uh, this is an option, again, optional for critical access hospitals, but it's a outcome based performance measure related to total hip and total knee, where essentially you do a pre post survey of your patients and ask for their assessment of pain and function. Because really that's the, that's the goal, right? Like they have a hip or knee and they actually have less pain and better function. So this is a way to get at that measure. Uh, the timing for it's somewhat complicated because there's windows, pre-surgery, that type of thing. Um, but we do encourage you to take a look at this for those of you that are doing um, total hips and totals knees. It's mandatory um, for PPS hospitals starting in um, quarter three of next year. It'll also be mandatory for outpatient procedures. The timing is a little bit later. But again, if you're doing hips and knees, would we encourage you to be thinking about whether or not you're capturing or thinking about this information. There's a similar measure related to cataracts that is in, right this point entirely voluntary, both for larger hospitals and for critical access hospitals, but it's also a pre post serve a measure that's looking at a standardized tool. So when we talk about patient reported outcome measures, this is the kind of thing that they're talking about. Likely we'll see more of this in the future. I do wanna highlight the hospital commitment to health equity measure. I'm guessing you've been talking about this because it is a new MBQIP core measure and this ties back into that um, interest in sort of focusing on equity in, by CMS. This is the structural measure where you would respond to questions in different domains um, that basically outline what your hospital is doing in terms of leadership data analysis, data collection related to equity. It's an attestation that in through that secure portal, there's five domains, you would answer questions, you get point in each domain. So the next reporting deadline for this one will be May and that will reflect 2024 activity. And that is also um, um, an MBQIP measure and that aligns with the MBQIP 2025. And the quarter three monster at that's the quarter three 2025 is only for is required for PPS hospitals, optional for critical access hospitals for the patient reported outcome measures that we were just talking about. I jumped back a slide. Okay. Oh, I can look. I might have my date wrong. Thank you. Also related to equity is the screening for social drivers of health measure. So this is looking at the percent of patients that are being screened in patients, patients that are being screened for all five of the following health related screens. So this is not a yes or no. This is a how many inpatients do you have and how many of them were screened for each of these areas. So it's a numerator and denominator submission. There's not a specified screening tool that's required, but you do have to cover all five areas. There is a list of suggested tools available. Um, more details with the measure specifications there. Again, this gets reported once a year. So in May of 2025, you would go in and enter numerator and denominator for all of your patients in calendar year 2024. So in terms of meeting reporting, if you didn't screen anybody, you could say zero. And that would meet the reporting requirement. Obviously, that's not the goal. The goal is for folks to kind of be thinking about how you implement um, screening and follow up for, for this. But the piece around the measure is actually whether or not you actually screened. The related measure is not really a quality measure. It's more of a descriptive measure. So whether or not you screen is actually like a process. You could kind of measure whether or not people are doing that. The screen positive essentially looks at, of those folks that you screened, how many of them screened positive? So that is not reflective of the care that you're providing in your hospital, but is reflective of the community that you're serving. So important data, but it's a little um, 
it's been a little bit controversial about whether or not this gets reported as a quality measure because it's not really about quality, it's really about who you serve. So similar reporting process. So you would, who, who did you screen for those five areas and then how many of them were positive that data gets entered, the numerator and denominator will get in, entered into the HQR portal. And it will be also due in May of next year for calendar year 2024. So on the horizon, no specific timeline um, at this point, but CMS did contract with a group out of Yale to do a ECQM specification that would be related to this measure. So there was a technical expert panel that was supposed to finish up their work this spring. So right now, at least for the next year or two, I anticipate this reporting will be similar the way it is right now. But I would guess in the next couple of years, we're likely to see this shifted into an eCQM type format. Okay, I'm going to take a breath before we go to HCAPS because there's a bunch of HCAPS changes. Any questions on social drivers, health related? Social needs screening. Okay, HCAPS. There's a bunch of changes coming to HCAPS. A lot of changes coming to HCAPS. Uh, the first set of changes is related to administration. Uh, the first is that as of January 1st, 2025, you will have the option to have a web-based mode of survey delivery. So I think lots of people would say it's about time kind of depends on who the population you serve is, but that web-based option would be available via email distribution. So if that's something that's interest of interest to your hospital, I'd be encouraging you to talk to your vendor. There are some pieces that have to happen. For example, you have to have be capturing emails if you want to do web-based survey delivery. But they have seen, um, for the most part, incorporating a web-based option has slightly indicated um, slightly increased survey response rates, if that's one of the ways that you're thinking about it. So again, you know your patient populations best, but it is now an option. It has not been an option in the past. Um, they also officially allowed patient proxy to complete the survey. My guess is that was probably happening anyway, but now that's actually like officially okay. Um, they extended the data collection period by a week in part to incorporate the process for web-based because if you do the web-based survey, it's um, not web only. You would also follow it up with a paper or a phone survey. So it gives you a little bit more room for a response. They have said that um, you can't add more than 12 supplemental items to your survey. So a lot of folks work with their vendors to add some additional questions. They're limiting that to 12. And then the other fairly significant one is that they're requiring collection of information about the language that the patient speaks while they're in the hospital. And if they prefer Spanish, they're required to do this Spanish translation for all patients. So at this point, they're really focusing on the Spanish component of that. The survey has been translated into several other languages, but so I think that you could work with your vendor to trigger that if you have groups that are speaking a variety of other languages, but they are really kind of leaning in on the Spanish side of that to try to help get folks uh, an appropriate survey. So those are all about administration. They're also making several changes to the survey itself. So for a while they were calling this HCAPS 2.0. So sometimes you'll see that language. They've sort of pulled back from that terminology and now they're just calling it the updated HCAPS survey but they are adding, removing, and changing a variety of questions. So there will actually be a handful more questions on the survey than there was previously. There's a few updates to the about you types of questions, but then they're changing some of the measures. So um, specifically they're removing the, what's currently the care transition submeasure and adding two measures around that kind of divide that up a little bit differently called care coordination and information about symptoms. And then they're modifying the riskfulness of hospital environment submeasure. So this is here for you guys for more detail. I just wanted you to give you a sense of the questions that are being removed. So for example, the one around call buttons, that's kind of an outdated technology. A lot of folks aren't using call buttons anymore. So they actually changed some of the language and shifted that. They're removing those three care transitions questions. And then um, they're removing uh, the way they're framing whether or not you came in through the emergency department. Here's the ones that are being added. So a bunch around restfulness. Rather than the care transitions, we've got some pieces around care coordination. And then rather than that care transitions, we're also talking about, you know, more specific about symptoms and health problems. 
So this new survey will start January 1, 2025. And then because we've based kind of anchoring and star ratings, this also impacts what's available for public reporting, right? So there will be a transition period because they HCAPS is published in four rolling quarters. So there will be a period where you have new, new survey, old survey data combined. So during that transition period, only the unchanged submeasures will be publicly reported. So there'll be a gap in there. There'll be about a year, year, a little longer than a year where you have a smaller set of HCAPS measures that is publicly reported. And then by the time we get to all the way, so you have four quarters worth of 2025 data using the new survey, that and they will start releasing the new submeasures as well. So that's anticipated by the time that kind of whole timeline plays out, it'll be like October, 2026, when the new submeasures will all be reported. So lots of changes in HCAPS. And then there's also several new measures. So these are all new measures that are required under the inpatient quality reporting program for um, PPS hospitals, optional for critical access hospitals. So we've got a couple of structural measures. The first one is patient safety structural measure. And it will sound similar, I think, to that hospital commitment to health equity. Um, there's five different domains. You would attest to specific practices within those five domains. You have to eat all, meet all the statements. So it's like a zero to five score. Um, the calendar year 2025 will be the first time that this is reported um, for, I, for inpatient quality reporting program. We do anticipate that this one is actually going to be reported through CDC, through NHSN, um, whereas the others are reported through the HQR portal. There's also an age-friendly hospital measure. I know this one's been getting a fair amount of publicity lately. I've been getting quite a few questions about it. Again, entirely optional for critical access hospitals, but if this is something you're focusing on, you're certainly welcome to be thinking about um, potentially improve in reporting this. It is a structural measure. Again, five domains. You would attest to different statements within those domains. And the calendar year 2025 will be the first required reporting for PPS hospitals. And so that would be on care, compare, and fall of 2026. So these kind of follow that. We're going to look at a calendar year. You report by May 15th is kind of the timing on all of these. So the age-friendly is one that's... Um, um, IHI and others are doing a lot of promotion around this. And I do think certainly relevant for critical access hospitals, but at this point it is definitely, it's optional under the inpatient quality reporting program. More new measures. There is a couple of new ECQMs that are gonna be available starting in calendar year 2026. There's a falls with injury, and then there's a post-operative um, respiratory failure rate measure. So these would be one of those measures that you can pick, you the self-selected measures. Um, they are revising that global malnutrition composite score to um, specify for 18 years and old, of age and older. It's currently 65 plus. If any of you have oncology locations, I'm guessing most of you don't have separate oncology locations, but they are pulling out specific CAUTI and CLABC measures for oncology-based locations. And then they're changing um, the claims-based measure around 30-day risk standardized death rate around for surgical patients. Again, not one that most critical access hospitals have calculated, but important that they are starting to include Medicare Advantage in this measure as well. So again, we're starting to see CMS incorporate that Medicare Advantage data, which I think is just becoming more and more important as more and more folks are in that program. Okay, this is probably the one slide of what's coming that I really want you to be aware of because this is a really significant change. So for the Promoting Interoperability Program, there is going to be a progressive increase in the number of mandatory electronic clinical quality measures that have to be reported. So critical access hospitals are held to promoting interoperability. Right now, you pick three measures plus safe use of opioids, and then the two pregnancy measures is the requirement. So you can see that here for calendar year 2025. But CMS is really starting to put the pedal down. And by 2028, all of the hospital harm-related measures will be required for reporting. So this is a pretty significant change. 
So they have also added a couple of new hospital harm measures. I will be surprised if next year those aren't also added into the required list. So got a couple years here. It's not happening immediately, but this is a really big shift in direction in terms of mandatory requiring or mandatory reporting, particularly around those patient safety measures. Some additional promoting, promoting interoperability um, changes under the public health and clinical data exchange. Um, there's, it's been a little bit confusing the way this was initially laid out was that they were calling antibiotic resistance use and service resistant surveillance one thing. They were calling it a AUR, but it's actually two things. So in my mind, this is a correction actually. So right now, the requirement is that you're doing AUR surveillance, but it's pretty unclear because you can either do antibiotic use or antibiotic resistance. They have clarified going forward in the rulemaking that it's kind of one, it's it's two separate things and they've clarified the exclusions. So oftentimes critical access hospitals might be able to do one or the other. And before you would, um, it was all bucketed together. So this is a little bit more clear going forward. They're also changing the scoring. So to, in order to meet the promoting air probability criteria, there's it's performance-based based on different objectives and they are increasing that scoring. So right now the threshold is 60 points. You have to have at least 60 points. And I made my notes here, 97% of critical access hospitals successfully meet that threshold of 60 points. They are moving it to 80 points over two years. And at that 80 point threshold, only about 78% of critical access hospitals would meet the 80 point threshold based on current data. So they are sort of upping the game for that as well. So it'll go to 70 points and then to 80 points. And then another change related to kind of quality and safety is that currently you have to go in and attest whether or not you have or have not used the safer guides, which are essentially a checklist that probably happens in your IT department that sort of walks through safety features related to your electronic health record. They are now saying that you have to not just that you have to attest yes or no, but you have to attest yes <laughs> to do that. And they are saying that they're likely to update those um, safer guides probably coming out in 2025. The most recent safer guides were put out in 2016. So certainly our technology has changed some. Whew. Okay, you guys, a couple more things. So everything I've shared so far are things that are. It might be new, it might be just beginning implemented, but they are things that have been finalized. These next couple slides that are, th are things that are proposed or that might be coming. So you may recall, again, that inpatient, outpatient operate on different timelines in terms of quality measures. These are the measures that were proposed to be added to the outpatient quality reporting program. That final rule it won't be available for another couple of weeks but they have proposed adding, and these will look familiar, uh, screening for social drivers of health, screening positive for social drivers of health, and the hospital commitment to health equity. I personally don't understand how you can have the hospital commitment to health equity in the inpatient and the outpatient because it's the same measure, <laughs> but we'll see what CMS says about that. So those should look familiar. And then they're also proposing what's called a patient understanding of key information. And this is a, it's a, one of those patient reported outcome measures. And it's a survey based metric that would um, happen a couple days after folks had an outpatient procedure or surgery. So those are the measures that have been proposed. These would be optional for critical access hospitals under the outpatient quality reporting program. And so we'll see, we'll know in the next week or two, it's usually early November when this rule gets finalized that um, whether or not those would be coming. They're also going to remove a couple measures and I highlight these because um, these two measures, oftentimes critical access hospitals do meet the threshold for a calculation, even though you don't have to do anything because they're claims-based, but they do roll into your hospital um, quality star rating because they're published on Care Compare. So they are going to be, they have proposed that they're gonna remove the MRI lumbar spine, a measure and the cardiac imaging measure. And then they're re proposing a public reporting change. So the emergency department arrival to departure, for a long time, they only published the, the rate for discharged patients. And now they started, last year, they started also publishing the rate for transferred patients. 
And now they're proposing that they will also publish the rate for psychiatric and mental patients on Care Compare. So that one's gotten a fair amount of pushback. I think we recognize that for most of you, that's entirely out of your control. <laughs> that's a, it's a big challenge, but that is a change in terms of not what's re- required to be reported, but what's publicly reported available out on Care Compare. They also proposed pretty significant new conditions of participation requirements related to labor and delivery and related to emergency services related to emergency OB care. So um, if those are finalized, I'm sure you will be hearing quite a bit about that from your hospital association and others. Um, there would be some fairly significant changes related to how you have organization of staffing, copy programs, readiness, equipment supplies, transfer protocols, all those types of things. So that was probably some of the bigger changes that were proposed, only proposed right now. The final rule will be out in a couple of weeks. And the last thing I want to share with you kind of to highlight is just, this is really the crystal crystal ball. Like we can kind of see what's coming. Um, CMS oftentimes includes what they call requests for information when they have a rulemaking process. And it oftentimes gives us a hint about what they're going to change in future years. So sometimes the next year, sometimes a couple of years. So two of the recent requests for information were related to the excess days and acute care measures. So talking about maybe doing some of that for outpatient. And then also they asked for information about potential modifications of hospital quality star rating methodology. So I'll be kind of surprised if we don't see some proposed changes to that methodology in the coming year, possibly too. Whew, and that is the changes, you guys. There's a lot. So I do always have to have just a plea that your input is needed. If you ever have opportunities to provide comments on proposed recommendations, rules, regulations, usually if there's anything open for comment right now, I see I have a colon, I have it linked right there. There is not anything open at this moment for comment. So either through the Office of Rural Health, through the Hospital Association, whatever uh, channels you have to kind of raise those questions or concerns are really important for CMS to hear them from you. Um, there's talking heads like me, but it's much more valuable for them to hear it directly from you if ever possible. And then I also just have a link here for the Partnership for Quality and Measurement. And they're um, encourage you to kind of follow, get their emails, follow up on what's happening there. Cause oftentimes that gives you hints about what's coming next in terms of measures. And then the rest of these slides are all resources. Cause I just threw a lot of information at you. Questions. And Amanda is sending the slides if you if you don't have them already. I know they're coming because there's all sorts of links in them. Yep. So the slides um, and the video of today's presentation will all be up on the MCRH website here within the next week. And then any other um, documents that Carla had sent over will also be attached um, on the website as well. And it is, it's a lot. There's a lot changing. So hopefully sort of teasing out What's specific to you as a critical access hospital? What's optional optional to you as a critical access hospital? But we know that you guys don't exist in a critical access hospital bubble. So hopefully some of that context of what else is happening is helpful as you're thinking about your priorities or what's, what's next. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you, Carla. I greatly appreciate all of the information. It's it's information overload for sure. Um, <laughs> so we, I know. we are ever so appreciative of what you've what you've done for us this afternoon. Um, if there aren't any additional uh, questions for Carla, um, we will go ahead and wrap up today's session. Again, Carla, thank yeah. you so much. And for everyone that joined today, thank you for taking an hour and about 15 minutes out of your time today to join. Um, and again, if you think of questions later. Amanda and Crystal know how to get a hold of me. Many of you know how to get a hold of me directly as, as well. Feel free to send them my way. Yep, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Appreciate you joining in. Have a great remainder of your week. Okay. Right. Thank you. Bye, everybody. <laughs>